a couple have been coming to our church, a crack addict and his girlfriend. And uh, they've been coming to our church for about uh, two, three months now. And I, I go over to their house, which is just really, it's just a step above a crack house. And um, everyone upstairs is using and, and um, they're in their own little apartment at the bottom, which is just completely trashed. And I knock on the door in the morning, about 11 o'clock in the morning, and uh, open the door and he's sleeping on the couch. And I'm like, so what's up? Like, what did you do? Uh, last night to get you kicked out onto the couch and he said you know what Brad I just I just think you know you keep talking about the gospel and about Jesus and I just think Jesus wouldn't want me sleeping with her so I've just decided that that's what needs to happen so instead of handing someone a moralistic do's and don'ts the Bible is all about moralism and that's how we oftentimes read it um, instead we just begin to incarnate the gospel and say Jesus loves you let, let, let him change your life and transform your life um, that's what, that is a huge triumph for us, to see the gospel begin to really penetrate this young guy's life. Um, and then he came to me uh, about two weeks ago, and he's, when he got a job, uh, he and his girlfriend got a job, and they got on the methadone program to kind of reduce their, their usage. And um, he came to me and said, you know what, I, I made this budget thing, because money is one of my worst enemies for using. So uh, I made this budget thing, and, and I've just been thinking on my way over to talk to you today, I need to redo it. And I'm like, well, why do you need to redo it? And he said, because I think Jesus wants me to give money to him. And uh, I said, well, why do you think? Does he need your money? He said, no, no, I think it's just he gave me the job and I'm supposed to give money back. The biggest hurdle we face is the skepticism from um, people outside of the church who think that we're trying to sell them and convert them. Um, and really, that's been the, ad the agenda of church, right? Is to um, convert people. And we're like saying, wait a minute, that's Christ's job and our job is to love and offer dignity and show them what the kingdom of heaven is about and what it could be like and life should be better for all because of Christ rising. We're offering belonging and total um, community and relationship even if they never buy our product. People want us to say, uh, how many people do you have saved? Um, and what we want to say is how many people are changing the things they care about towards what Jesus cared about. That's more important to me. My name's Nick Brotherwood. As you can probably tell from my accent, I wasn't born anywhere around here. I was born 57 years ago. I know you're all thinking, no, he looks much older than that, but actually only 57 years in London, England. I grew up in a believing family. We started off our belief journey as evangelical Anglicans, then moved to a part of South London where there weren't any evangelical Anglican churches, and my mum very helpfully found a really good Baptist church. So that's where I grew up. So my roots are Baptist, even though I'm now an Anglican minister. I pitched an idea to our then Archbishop back in 2002 and to my surprise he, he uh, said yeah I'll put a half-time position uh, behind it and so in January 2002 um, we started getting a group together to plan for what was to become Emerge, we didn't know that was the name at the time. Montreal, as uh, I guess most Canadians know, is and Quebec in its entirety has been heavily, heavily influenced and shaped by uh, Roman Catholicism over 350 or more years. And so it's very much a culture that's in reaction against that. And the reaction nah, hasn't been that violent, but it's still there and it's very definite. If you look at the architecture around, it looks big and impressive, especially the ecclesiastical architecture and therefore the church has uh, presented itself as something to do with power and control and um, subjecting people. I think that's a kind of a popular um, idea of, about church. So I think people are, are allergic to church, what they conceive to be church here in Montreal. And so the climate is high on being spiritual but very low on being uh, Christian. Coming down the pipe um, is the need to, to face the, the challenge of, of being followers of Jesus in a world, in a culture that doesn't see being a follower of Jesus as a very important thing. The move from being central to Canadian society to our present peripheral 
um, placement is, is a huge change and we've got to fully adjust to that change. Um, I see it's, it's a calling to return to roots um, uh, and, and also for institutions, um, denominations like the Anglican ones, the challenge of, of how do we handle the physical buildings and infrastructure that was developed for Christendom in a post-Christendom age. I think there's wonderful resources there, but it's also a massive challenge for people that are in charge of that kind of thing. So there's, um, how do we handle the, the heritage that we've got? And how, how are we appropriately humble in, in representing ourselves as, as not as institution, but as, as community, as followers of Jesus in, in the, an exciting time, but I think a ta challenging time for, for all of us here in Canada. It has been said that tradition is the handing down of that which is of value to the next generation. In many ways, these new and evolving forms of church are borrowing from the very best of Christian tradition and re-engaging it within the present. The point, however, is not to merely sacrifice their lives to bolster up antique practices, but to channel their efforts into the creation of fresh yet accurate expressions. Balancing tradition and innovation, these burgeoning communities are working out their faith and theology out loud. This too brings a sense of connection with those who have gone before them, ultimately resulting in an expression that is both sacred and timely. Well, the first thing is I think that there's a, a huge difference in ancient and dated. So things that are dated, we just were really not interested in. But there's a, a rich Christian heritage that uh, we try to tap into. Um, that is beautiful. It's like reaching into the, the dumpster of church history and, and pulling out stuff that, uh, that just makes sense to us. If the roots go deep, then, then the tree can stand a lot, of, a lot of wind, a lot of movement. And so the, the balance, it's, it's less balancing and more rooting. Uh, we have a strong sense of, um, of this being deeply rooted in the, the great liturgical sacramental tradition. Yes. There's this sense of taking stuff that's ancient and has been part of our history and our heritage, taking stuff that's current, part of our culture, and taking stuff that's original to us and kind of mushing that all together and allowing that to speak into who we are. That allows us then, within, within those sort of lines, to flex and move and explore and experiment. But there's always this sense of, okay, where does this come from? How is this rooted? What are we doing with this? So from the fathers, we start to learn that the things that are necessary for the church and the cores. And then as we start to balance innovation, we just say, well, what were they doing back then? Well, some of them were, were expressing their theology and poetry. Okay, well, innovation, using poetry is not innovative, but maybe using hip hop is. So we'll incorporate some hip hop. So it's kind of a blending of the two, seeing how the, how the traditional churches were originally innovative and trying to say, okay, how can we do that in our culture and bring that in? As far as being innovative, whatever you can do that you can point towards Jesus, be as innovative as possible. We, we know Jesus' command to love one another involves relating to how do we do that? We want to do it in a way that's not hypocritical, that's real, but also that, that takes account of the tradition that we're part of, that the church has, has been there for 2,000 years. Yes, we're the current contemporary expression of that church, and that's exciting and exhilarating and a challenge, but we want to um, ride on that, that wave of tradition that's there. It's really important to us to create space for people who normally wouldn't be allowed to have space in church. Like people who are not just rough around the edges or don't have the answers, but people who really need space to ask questions. So early on, we didn't really know, uh, well, we didn't really know what we were doing, and we didn't really have an actual destination in Hamilton. 
So we kind of uh, were a little bit transient when we, when we started, trying to figure ourselves out. And eventually we landed on this neighborhood, Beasley, which is the third poorest neighborhood in Canada. It, uh, it made a lot of sense for us for a few reasons. Number one, we really wanted to be part of, of urban renewal. Social justice is really big to us. We knew that we wanted to be where uh, there was diversity. This little strip of town is known as International Village. And uh, there's a lot of a, a blossoming artist community. So our idea is to really blend deep community, justice, and the arts. And so uh, this type of a neighborhood is really what we're looking for. When we started, uh, we didn't really have a building that we were uh, meeting out of. We, we planted the church in 2002, and it wasn't until 2005 that we actually purchased this CIBC bank building and renovated it into a coffee house. And part of the reason why we were able to do that was because often the Salvation Army gets left legacies. So someone actually uh, died and left over 100,000 specifically to a Salvation Army church downtown. And since we're the only one, we were uh, we got to, to have that money and our our tribe the Salvation Army has also been very supportive financially in helping us to to kind of get established in this neighborhood so really um, for a, a young broke new church plant we were able to purchase a building with almost no money of our own we borrowed the rest that we needed from our, our tribe and uh, we were able to do this, use this space to, to be part of our neighborhood um, probably before we really should have been able to do that. I think when it comes to sustainable mission, I guess part of the goal is to find things that uh, allow you to have kingdom presence in a place, but also can, uh, can help you to become a sustainable community. The coffee house for, for us is one of those examples. Um, the reality is that uh, selling fair trade coffee and delicious panini sandwiches and uh, renting out our space to organizations who we love and value also for us creates a way that we can, uh, that we can support the space. The reality is we, we, we pay for a building that we didn't really have money for. Um, so the Salvation Army has a history of um, living out Christian identity in places that are often abandoned, and our story is no different. Um, in terms of mission and theology and um, support and like uh, just being together, we're a really significant part of the Salvation Army, and they're really significant to us as a community. Uh, we don't look like other Salvation Army churches. We don't uh, necessarily have the same ecclesiology as everywhere else, but uh, that's been cool with them and cool with us. And uh, really, I think we're doing what the Salvation Army has kind of always done in its history, which is move into places abandoned and, and try to be part of, uh, of rebuilding, bringing hope to people who are in desperate need of it. In a way, these upstart communities are forced to be innovative. Their values of reform and experimentation often collide with the necessities needed for sustainability. Thus, a tension is created that puts these communities in a place of perpetual risk. While this challenge often shapes their ethos, the lack of resources, profile, or success as defined by prior generations makes these fledgling churches easy targets for a variety of predators. How then must Canada's established churches and movements respond to these new explorers? Author Gerard Kelly shares the hope that somewhere in the genesis and genius of these diverse groups is hidden the future of Western Christianity. To dismiss them is to throw away the seeds of our survival. <laughs>